Good morning, and welcome to a special Commander Series interview with General James B. Hecker. My name is Matthew Kranig. I'm Vice President and Senior Director of the Atlantic Council's Scowcroft Center for Strategy and Security. Today, we're excited to provide you with an inside look at how the U.S. Air Force is addressing priorities and responding to crises in the European and African theaters. We're joined today by General James Hecker, the Commander of U.S. Air Forces in Europe and Air Forces Africa, as well as the Commander of NATO's Allied Air Command. Meetos, meetings like this are central to the Scowcroft Center's mission of developing sustainable, nonpartisan strategies to address the most important security challenges facing the United States and its allies, and we also seek to honor the legacy of service of General Brent Scowcroft. This interview marks the latest installment of our Commander Series hosted by our Forward Defense Program and generously supported by Saab, uh, which provides a forum for senior military leaders to discuss their priorities and strategy for advancing U.S. and allied security. And so with that, let's uh, dive in. Uh, General Hecker, welcome to the Atlantic Council. Well, thanks, Matt. I appreciate the opportunity. So um, you oversee a massive area of responsibility, home to 104 nations, command U.S. air power across 19 million square miles. What, what are your strategic priorities across the European and African theaters? H how are the challenges in these regions distinct? And, and how does uh, uh, allies and, and partners play into, uh, play into uh, all of this? Well, things have been busy, as you know, in both USAFE and AF Africa. And I think I'll start off with talking about the Ukraine crisis that uh, started in February of 2022. Uh, we've looked and analyzed a lot of lessons learned that have come out of that. And based on that, I've come up with five priorities that we need to make sure that we're ready should we have to uh, invoke Article 5. And of course, you know, number one is deterrence. We don't want to go to war. So all these priorities that I'll discuss are really aligned towards deterrence so we don't have to do this. Uh, but the first priority and really came out of the lessons learned out of the Ukraine war was we know either side has not been able to get air superiority. And we know how important air superiority has is. Uh, we've had it for a long time. You know, if you look back to Desert Storm, we had to fight for it a little bit. Primarily, that was in the air is, is how we fought for it. Um, and then <coughs> we've gained air superiority and we've had it ever since. We've had it uh, through Afghanistan, largely uncontested, Syria, uh, and all these things. We don't have it now. Uh, when I say we don't have it, Ukraine doesn't have it or Russia doesn't have it. And you see the kind of war that happens if you don't have their superiority. It's 155 rounds going back and forth, lots of casualties, cities that are just demolished, and we can't stand for that. So to make sure that we don't uh, end up in that situation, uh, should Article 5 uh, be invoked, uh, our top priority is to make sure we can do counter A2AD or anti-access aerial denial. And what we've seen, you know, if Ukraine tries to fly up in Russian territory, those their integrated air and missile defense system shoots down their aircraft. Likewise, when Russia has tried to go across the Ukrainian border, they have shot down Russian aircraft, over 75 of them. So the first priority is to make sure that we can neutralize those anti-access aerial denial uh, integrated air and missile defense system that Russia has. Uh, so that's one of our top priorities is to make that happen. And it's not going to be as easy as it was in Desert Storm. It's going to require uh, several um, other services besides just the Air Force. Uh, Space Force is going to be involved. Cybercom is going to be involved. Uh, Navy with cruise missiles and Army, uh, special operators. It's going to be a truly team effort to make sure that we neutralize the enemy's integrated air and missile defense system. Um, what we've seen since Russia has not been able to get air superiority is the way they're fighting is they're sending very precise one-way UAVs that they purchased from Iran, uh, or they're using cruise missiles that are launched off their long-range bomber aircraft. Um, so we need to make sure that we're prepared for that in NATO. So our second priority is to make sure that we have a very integrated air and missile defense systems ourselves so when they launch these kind of attacks, we're able to shoot them down. And that's what we're helping the Ukraine out with right now, is to make sure that they have a good integrated air and missile defense system. And several countries, over 50 countries, have been donating things. And a lot of that goes towards surface-to-air missiles to prevent that threat. Um, now, as you know, our national defense strategy, we concentrate on China. Uh -huh. um, and that's fine because a lot of the things that are developed for China you know, we can use over in our theater as well. Um, but what we need to, to make sure is that we get the most out of 
every partner that we have in NATO. And, you know, we're up to 31 now with the joining of Finland, and hopefully we'll be at 32 fairly soon. Uh, and we need to make sure that we share information with them, uh, and they share information with us to make sure that they're as lethal as possible. And there are several examples of where we've been able to do that, whether it's uh, mission data files on the F-35, or where, whether it's points of interest that we're allowed to give them now that we weren't able to give them before. And this really increases the capability of the NATO, all 31 nations, uh, so it's been going very well. Uh, our fourth priority is command and control. Uh, we need to make sure that we have a good way to command and control all of the 31 NATO forces. Um, so we're coming up with different ideas on how we can do that. And it really comes down to distributed operations and making sure that we have resilient, redundant communication so we can talk uh, to our forces that are out in the field. Uh, and then the last thing that I'll talk about as a priority is ACE, uh, Agile Combat Employment. And uh, what we've seen uh, is in the past, we've had to disperse our aircraft amongst a particular airfield. Well, that's not good enough now with the precision and the weapons that our enemies have. So now we have to disperse our aircraft amongst different airfields. Uh, so we're making sure we're, we're, we have that capability. And if you remember, you know, over 30 years ago, we could take off anywhere in Europe, land at any base, be able to get gas and be able to get weapons and those kind of things. And over the last 30 years, you know, we haven't we haven't paid attention to that as much. So we're really starting to pay attention to that again. So those are the five priorities that I think will make sure that we uh, can provide a deterrence so we never have to go to war with Russia. Well, it's a very clear set of priorities and it's to deal with um, multiple crises on, on both continents now. And I wanted to turn first to the ongoing crises in, in Africa, including the recent coup in Niger, the standoff with the economic community of West African states known as uh, ECOWAS. H how have these incidents impacted U.S. military planning and strategy uh, in Africa? And are you working with U.S. partners in West and Central Africa to, to address these challenges? Yeah, we're, we're working with all our partners there. You know, uh, I will have phone calls with the chief staff of the French Air Force to make sure uh, that we're trying to you know, solve this problem diplomatically. The, the, the last thing we want to have happen is uh, we don't want a, a shooting war over there. Uh, and the good news is we've been vastly successful at doing that. Um, so with the help of the State Department, you know, uh, when it first started out, we weren't quite sure and we were really worried about the force protection of our folks. So we rebalanced um, some of the, our basing between uh, Air Base 101 and Air Base 201. Um, you know, to that end, just in case something bad happened. And the good news is that it, it, it didn't, and it hasn't, and we don't expect it to because of the strong diplomatic efforts uh, that the State Department has put forward. Now, we still have uh, things that we need to do. Um, for a while there, I think everyone realizes the airspace was closed and those kind of things. And now the airspace is starting to slowly uh, uh, come back up and we're able to do some of our surveillance operations, primarily for force protection uh, in the area. Uh, so that's helping us out uh, quite a bit to make sure that we're comfortable. And all the intelligence shows right now that the risk to uh, to our forces is fairly low. Uh, but we need to make sure that if something happens, we're ready to go. And if we're called upon to evacuate the embassy or American citizens, that we're ready to do that. And we're in a good position now that they're starting to allow us to use some of our surveillance for force protection again. Mm -hmm. So turning to the other uh, major theater in your area of responsibility and, and the war in Ukraine, uh, last month the United States approved Denmark and the Netherlands to send F-16 fighter jets to Ukraine. Uh, how do you think F-16s will affect the Ukrainian military's uh, progress in, in the counteroffensive? Are, are they going to be a game changer? I wouldn't say it's going to be a game changer. It's not going to be the one thing that all of a sudden Ukraine's going to gain air superiority. Uh, as I mentioned earlier in my comments, it's going to be hard enough for 31 nations to go against A2AD. Um, so to expect one nation to do that and think that an F-16 is going to turn the tide, it's not going to be the case. Uh, but it does help them modernize their military. And I, we think about this as a long game. You know, they're going to get some F-16s, you know, here in the future. Um, but they're going to need some other things to go along with those F-16s. And they're not going to take an F-16 with some training and all of a sudden be as good as people that have been flying the F-16 for 10 years. It takes some time to learn the tactics, techniques, and procedures 
but it definitely will help because a lot of the weapons that we have provided Ukraine, uh, whether it be the harm missiles or JDAM extended range, those are being retrofitted to a MiG-29 aircraft. So the interoperability is not near as good as it's going to be when they get an F-16, and then they'll be able to do more with the weapons that we provide them. So it's definitely going to help uh, in the short term a little bit, and the long term we'll even be better off, but it's not going to be a game changer overnight. That makes sense. And um, so Ukraine's advancing its air capabilities, uh, U.S. Air Force also upgrading its capabilities, uh, fifth generation aircraft. And you talked about this already a little bit in your priorities, but maybe we could uh, dig in a, a little bit more. How is the Air Force evolving its approach to uh, air warfare as it watches what's happening in Ukraine? And what are the technological bets? We've, we've done a lot of work on kind of emerging technology here in the Scowcroft Center. What, what are some of the technological bets that you think that would, can help the United States maintain air dominance uh, into the future? Well, there's, there's quite a few things, but we're definitely going to school based on what we've seen uh, from Russia. Uh, and one of the big things, it's my number one priority, um, is counter A2AD. And what we were able to do is we brought in several senior captains, junior majors that were experts in their field. And we brought them to Ramstein from all 31 nations. And we gave them two weeks to figure out how to best go against the counter A2AD mission. And they uh, put together, you know, packages, you know, this many aircraft, this type of aircraft, this many jammers, this cyber effect, this uh, space effect, um, how the Navy is going to integrate with this as well as the Army. Uh, and we came up with a plan for how we're going to get after this. And we're not just going to stop there and do that on just this one plan. We're actually going to go out and exercise that plan. So we're going to do it first in small pieces. So we'll take a chunk of the plan and we'll exercise that. And then we have a culminating exercise that is going to occur in uh, the fall of 2024. It's called the Ramstein flag, similar to the red flag that we're going to have. And that's going to be held in Greece. Uh, and we're going to do that. And we're going to get all these players together. And we're going to actually exercise it, live fly it with other services, as well as uh, Spacecom and Cybercom assets, and uh, do it for two weeks. Uh, and we'll get very proficient. And, this, uh, I think, is going to provide a very good deterrence and get a very good capability that NATO will be able to take down the Russian integrated air missile defense at scale, as opposed to just, you know, hit one area. We can do it, you know, simultaneously with the help of the 31 nations. And the good news is, um, for us in NATO, since the invasion of Ukraine, we have had a vast increase in F-35 sales which is really a big player when it comes to counter A2AD. Um, so far, we had three countries sign an LOA uh, that they're going to buy a 35 aircraft. Finland, newly joined, is going to buy 64 of them, 36 from Switzerland, and 35 from Germany. And in addition to that, we have five other countries who will soon sign an LOA, and then two other that are interested. So that's 10 different countries which will give us probably a little over 600 F-35s wow. in the next decade. Uh, and of those, you know, only 54 of them are going to be U.S. The others are bought and paid for by our European partners uh, in NATO. And we're making sure that we're sharing information with them to make those aircraft as capable as possible. Well, General Hecker, it's been a fascinating conversation. I have many more questions, but I think that we're um, out of time. So I would just like to thank you for taking the time to speaking with me today. Well, thanks, man, and I appreciate it, and thanks to the North Atlantic Council for giving me the opportunity to talk a little bit about what we're doing over in Europe and Africa. It was our pleasure, and, and to our audience watching, thank you very much for joining us, and please stay tuned for future programming from the Atlantic Council Scowcroft Center.